This is Park Chung Hwan again from Ulsan Hub Dental Clinic. Continuing from the last time, I'll give a lecture on the remaining topics. On the wide range membrane elevation method for hydraulic elevation of the maxillary sinus, in other words, how to elevate more using the method. We'll discuss about the method using DioNavi system. Personally, for maxillary sinus, there are multiple systems among crestal surgery methods. When we analyze by focusing on not ripping the membrane as much as possible, that system would be, in my opinion, osteotom. I personally believe that osteotom has the lowest chance of the membrane perforation. Then why do we use the hydraulic elevation method? In the early days of osteotom, there were a lot of vibrations. So, in rare cases among patients, tinnitus could occur, and anybody would feel a little bit uncomfortable with the thumping vibration. So, I personally prefer the hydraulic elevation method that lifts using relatively a lot of drilling. There is a disadvantage to hydraulic elevation. When we implant immediately after extraction, hydraulic elevation might not work well, because there is water leakage from the side. Of course, when Dr. Jo young Suk from the 22nd century Seoul Dental Hospital does it, he lifts using hydraulic elevation, he does it really well. But for general dental offices like us, it's a little bit more difficult to do, because he really goes for it. Compared to Dr. Cho's surgery style, we're more timid, and it's not easy for us to go for it like that. So we have some difficulty with implanting immediately after extraction. So what method do I use? When I implant immediately after extraction, hydraulic elevation sometimes works and sometimes it doesn't. If hydraulic elevation doesn't work, I proceed like osteotom. For that, I would use a conventional surgical kit. So let's talk through this case. I extracted number 26. I waited a little bit after the extraction for the surgery. This case is interesting. Look carefully. The membrane is lifted a lot toward the backside. What's unique to this case is that I added almost 3 cc's exactly. I added 3 cc's and almost all of the 3 cc's went in exactly. So I want to take a look at this case and discuss it. First, you can learn a few things here. When young clinicians perform membrane elevation, they ask about the elevation tilting to one side. That's correct. For this case, the membrane is lifted more towards the back. When we look at the dome shape raised in the middle, about this much in the middle, the number 7, it's raised as if it's lifted from the mesial root. This happened because the membrane didn't lift as much on the mesial side. If we lifted with 1 cc, it could have been problematic because the membrane would have lifted only in the back and the mesial side would not have lifted at all, which can result in less bone formation on the mesial side. Or even worse, you might see perforation on the mesial side. But since I added 3 cc's, even though the membrane is raised in the back more, that is, for example, if it was raised in the middle, it should ideally lift up like this. But for this case, the water pressure went in this way. It is elevated in the back, on one side only. But it still elevated the membrane. That's because I injected a large amount of saline rather than a small amount. The elevation eventually included the mesial side, even though it was mostly toward the backside. Do you guys understand this? So, when you elevate the membrane a lot, you can actually avoid a lot of common problems. I think this case demonstrates that very well. Now I'll answer some questions in a Q&A format. When you conduct surgeries with DioNavi and use hydraulic elevation, you have to shave off the bone to a certain level to lift the membrane. So, how can you know this? First, normally there's a hydraulic elevation instrument. On the front of the rubber tip, you place it in the drill hole and add saline. At this time, if the pressure is too high, then not enough bone has been removed. So, you can know it in that way. Also, some say there are cases where there is no perforation and it seems like all the lower bone has been removed, but hydraulic elevation doesn't occur. This could actually happen, but why? First, you may think otherwise, but it could be that the lower bone has not been sufficiently removed. Yes, that could be the case. Also, it could happen if it is slanted. 
If you drill in a slanted area, the surface is not flat. So when we drill initially, it goes in this way. In other words, the corner gets drilled first, the membrane breaks like this, then the hole in this area is very small. When it's small, it may not lift up when you add water pressure. If the hole is too small, what can you do? You can drill a little bit more. What will happen if you drill a little bit more? It becomes like this. Then the hole will get a little bigger. When it's bigger, then the membrane will lift with water pressure. Does this happen frequently? In particular, when there is a slant and it feels like the lower bone has been mostly removed, how can you know if it's completely removed? You can think about the osteotom system for this. When you drill with a stopper and there is not much bone left, then the drill lifts up. You can really feel this. What I mean is, when the bone below the membrane becomes very thin, it means it has been removed by drilling. And if you use the next drill that is longer, it will go in all the way, it will lift with the bone. Does this make sense? It lifts the bone and elevates with it without ripping the membrane. So this is the surest way. Especially if you use the Dionavi surgical guide, you can clearly experience this advantage. Since it has a clear path for the drill, it drills without shaking so you can clearly feel it. So for most surgeries, I can sense it when I use Dionavi. It went in all the way. The sinus floor is open. The membrane should be lifted by now. I can now conduct hydraulic elevation for the membrane. You can sense these things most of the time. There are, of course, many times you can't sense it. So, as I explained, if you can feel that it pushed and lifted the bone, then you can know for sure that the membrane hasn't ripped. That's what I think. Next, there are many questions about if I add the three cc's all at once. I never do it like that. I add about three cc's to a five cc syringe. Sometimes I add four to five cc's. Then I put in about one cc and take it out, in and out. I do it slowly. I do it this way because what is important in hydraulic elevation of maxillary sinus? The most important thing is to not hit the membrane. So I add 1 cc with the syringe and take it out to continuously check if the membrane has ripped or not. As you know about syringes, there is a bit of resistance when you push and pull out. And it should take in blood as well, not foam. This indicates that it's not ripped most of the time. You can't know for sure, but this is a pretty accurate method. The method to check that I personally prefer the most is the syringe method. Also, I explained in the first lecture, when you carry out hydraulic elevation on number 14, number 15, and number 16 consecutively, there are two ways to do it. One is to do one first and place an implant to block the hole and then perform sinus lift. Or another way, is to choose the one that is easier to perform hydraulic elevation without ripping and strategically elevating it a lot to lift the neighboring membrane as well. I brought another case for you with a different theme to show ways to know whether the membrane is perforated. The conclusion is that it's good to try all methods that you can use. When you try various methods, you will find one that suits you. You can find the checking method that you feel the most comfortable with. We can think of many things. Try blowing your nose. As you spray saline, you can check by asking, does water flow to your nose? Or like I mentioned earlier, does blood come up when you pull up the syringe? Is there a bit of resistance when you add using a syringe? Sometimes there's no resistance, it's rare. For some people, the membrane elevates very easily. Then, there's almost no resistance. But what's certain is that when you take it out, you don't see foam or air come up as you pull up the syringe. So using various methods, check if it has ripped or not. So personally, in the surgical field, the most certain way is to use a syringe to add and take out saline and sense the pressure. This is a matter of experience. So you need to have your own rule of thumb.
You may wonder about needing too much bone graft if the membrane is lifted a lot. In the first lecture, we saw the bone graft material going over to the distal side. This can happen. But, as I explained earlier, if the membrane is lifted a lot, the level of relapse itself is small. You can think of bone grafting like the saying the left hand is there just to support. And some people say that when they perform hydraulic elevation, the membrane rips and it barely lifts. We can consider a few reasons for this. First, in my point of view, the biggest reason is that the drilling is not stable. Next, there are cases where the clinicians don't follow the recommended protocol and finish drilling the hole all the way and then start inserting the tube for hydraulic elevation. You can be almost certain that the membrane will be perforated. So if you look at the tools for CAS kit or hydraulic elevation kit like Dionavi, Crestal Sinus kit from implant companies, there are protocols provided by the brands. They usually recommend performing hydraulic elevation when the diameter is about 2.8 to 3.2. It's difficult to perform if the diameter is too wide. The protocols recommend otherwise because you actually need a bit of pressure, so we need to follow the protocol. So if you finish the final drill at 4.3 to 5.0 and then place the rubber tip, the chance of leakage is high. So think about these two things. If the membrane rips, check if you follow the protocol to the T and check how big the drilled hole is at the time of hydraulic elevation. Second, check if the drilling was stable, if there was any shaking. So I think the Dionavi surgical guide has a huge advantage. It's a huge advantage. Next, do we need to take out the saline that we added into the maxillary sinus so that it'll be easier to add the bone? I heard that some lecturers say this in their lectures. I didn't hear it directly. There was one professor who introduced this concept. If you add 0.8 cc's, then this space lifts up a little bit. For this small lift to not be released as much as possible, bone graft material like heterogeneous bone graft is added. What's the reason for not adding an allogeneic bone graft? It's because if you use allogeneic bone graft, the release occurs faster. So heterogeneous bone graft is used for the maxillary sinus. So this professor is saying that even the space for saline is a waste in order to protect this space. In order to add bone graft material after removing saline from the space, he explained it this way. But if we think about it medically, saline gets absorbed by the body. Because it's near the alveolar crest area, the saline definitely will come out. Of course, not all of it. But water will certainly move downward. So it's not necessary to remove the saline. Especially if the membrane is lifted a lot like this, there's even less need to do so. So I don't remove the saline. And how about adding PRF after hydraulic elevation? Some people ask this question, and I think this is okay. It lowers the possibility of the membrane ripping due to the bone graft material. So in that sense, I think it's very meaningful. There is a debate about PRF promoting ossification, or that it has a bigger effect in ossification. In my opinion, I don't think it plays that role to that extent, but it's meaningful to add it to prevent the membrane from ripping. But personally, I don't add any PRF. I only use saline. And when I use Dionavi for my sinus elevation, there's definitely less ripping. Like I mentioned before, when we elevate the membrane a lot, there's significantly less membrane perforation. In order to use a surgical method like mine that induces a lot of bone formation by elevating the membrane a lot, there are prerequisites. First, the membrane cannot be perforated. If the membrane rips, it can amount to nothing. Of course, it's not a failure if the membrane rips. Even if perforation occurs, if it rips after it's been elevated somewhat, then enough bone formation will occur. However, there will be a difference in the amount of bone formation. So the first prerequisite that is the most important in this lecture is that the membrane cannot be perforated. You can achieve high elevation only if the membrane isn't ripped. If the membrane rips, then you cannot apply pressure during membrane elevation through the perforated hole. So it won't elevate as much as you want it to. So it's very important that the membrane doesn't get ripped. To this end, it's very useful to use a navigation system like Dionavi. I've been using Dionavi for eight years since it first launched. The biggest advantage is that you drill along the hole in the stent so there is a nice drilling path. When you use a navigation system, the drilling path is stable no matter the circumstance. 
That's the biggest advantage. When you perform hydraulic elevation on the maxillary sinus in the analog way, it doesn't always perforate, but there is a high chance, because the drill bounces off the cortical bone. So if you hold the handpiece with both hands and try to keep it from shaking as much as possible, it's okay. But if the path gets compromised due to the shaking and gets to the bone, especially for slanted membranes, the tip gets caught and rips, so there's a high chance of perforation. The hydraulic elevation method was introduced a couple of years after the navigation surgery method. I think it was two to three years after. There wasn't a system like this in the beginning. There wasn't a designated kit for maxillary sinus. Even after a maxillary sinus kit was released, I didn't use it for one to two years because I didn't trust it. So I started doing Dionavi surgeries eight years ago, but it's only been five years since I started using the maxillary sinus specific protocol. So before that, I used the analog method for hydraulic elevation of maxillary sinus. Even now, I sometimes use the analog method. I used it for a longer time. But when I compare the number of membrane perforations using navigation versus when I use the analog method with my hands, there's a huge difference. The navigation method has way fewer perforation cases. Since I do way more navigation surgeries now, there are a lot more cases done with navigation, but the number of perforated cases using the analog method is still far greater. So in my opinion, I think the fundamental reason is the stable drilling. The next question, are there things to consider when performing hydraulic elevation of the maxillary sinus using navigation? There are several of these questions. The protocol for Dionavi system is so that hydraulic elevation is possible even with the stent on. But when you perform the surgery with a stent, it's hard to check, due to the rubber tip, whether it has been set properly or if there is water leakage to the side, because the stent covers it. So for beginners, I recommend you to perform hydraulic elevation without the stent. Then you can see with your eyes and check if there is any leakage. I think that would be good. Of course, there are times when I do it with the stent on, but I take it out to check as well. So coming back to the case, there is sufficient amount of bone on the palatal side, but there is less on the buccal side. As you can see, the membrane is lopsided. But because the membrane elevation is high, it doesn't cause any problems. The mesial side as well, since it lifts up as a whole. Next, I'll talk about perforation. Here's a quiz. Try to answer. There are six questions. Is this a perforation case or not? It's hydraulic elevation of the maxillary sinus, and I remember it as a navigation surgery case. Is this a perforation case? The membrane is lifted a lot, but there is perforation. It's a typical perforation. That's why you see the pool of saline on the horizontal line. It's parallel to the line, you see it clearly. This is a very obvious case of membrane perforation. This is because I didn't fasten the starter drill. I forgot to fasten the starter to the drill, so it definitely perforated the membrane. You can see the typical pool of saline parallel to the horizontal floor line. You can see the perforation in the CT image as well for this case. Then the patient also felt water flowing to their nose as a clinical symptom. I also clearly felt the perforation in the following surgery. So this was a perforation case. This is the second case. Is it a perforation case or not? If you look at the membrane, it doesn't look like a perforation case. But it had perforation. This patient had severe bone sclerosis. The bone was very hard. So even with the stent on, the drill still shook. For people with bone sclerosis, the drill moves around on its own even with the stent. It moves up and down. So accurate drilling was not possible. So as it continued to move around while drilling, the membrane ripped. In clinical symptoms, as well as observation and surgery, this case certainly was a perforation case. But in the CT image, it doesn't look like perforation. There are times when it's hard to know with the naked eye. This is the third case. Is this a perforation case or not? From the CT image, it looks like a typical perforation case. Yes, it looks like the horizontal line with saline. It is a perforation case. Water didn't flow to the nose. 
So I wasn't sure for this patient whether perforation occurred. But water doesn't necessarily flow to the nose. It could be due to a small amount of saline, or that the perforated hole was too small and not as much saline went in, and it didn't reach the middle opening. So I actually didn't know if it was perforated during the surgery, but I could infer from the image that it was perforated. This is the fourth case. Is it perforated or not? The apex and cortical bone line are almost the same. The answer is, it's not perforated. This is an interesting case. When I lifted the membrane, the drilling speed was at 1200 RPM. Not by accident, but on purpose. For this case, even if membrane perforation occurred, it wouldn't have mattered because there was so much remaining bone. So what does this mean? If there's a stopper and the elevation amount is small, that is, if the drilling that goes through the cortical bone of the maxillary sinus is small, then you can swiftly lift it a lot, similar to how you would do osteotome. This is possible because it's a navigation surgery with a surgical guide. 1200 RPM is a very high speed. Even with such high-speed drilling, because the guide has a stopper and it goes through an accurate path, the membrane instantly lifts up the bone underneath, and there is no perforation. It really happens. So this case suggests that if stable drilling is possible, even with high RPM, the membrane gets lifted quickly like osteotome and it does not rip. I think this is significant. Should we look at the next case? The membrane isn't ripped, right? The membrane elevation is good. This case, like the previous one, used high speed and lifted without saline addition. The membrane did not rip. So I think drilling that doesn't shake is the most important factor to avoid perforation. Of course, you shouldn't simply follow suit. I use this method on purpose to test it out, but I think 1200 RPM is a bit too fast. For final drilling, right before membrane elevation, it's good to lower the RPM. For general surgery, I use low speed for the final drilling. I don't recommend you use 1200 RPM. This is the sixth case. Is it a perforation case or not? It looks like there's a big rip in the membrane and it created a pool of saline, but it was not perforation. There's no membrane perforation and the surgical area lifted well. If you look at the four-month follow-up, you can see that there is good bone formation. In panorama view, the cortical line, which was visible before, can't be seen well now. Yes, it means ossification is happening. You can know through these things. So I'll talk about the platform for membrane perforation. The quiz was hard, right? It's hard. Someone very famous in maxillary sinus elevation said this once. I didn't hear it directly. If a clinician uses the Cresto approach for maxillary sinus to perform hydraulic elevation and guarantees whether membrane perforation occurred or not, he's a scammer, I agree. Even though I performed maxillary sinus elevation using the Cresto approach numerous times, many times, I wasn't sure whether membrane perforation occurred or not. There are times when you just can't tell. It's hard to check for membrane perforation, because the Cresto approach is a blind technique. You can check through x-ray, CT, or in the surgical field if the patient complains about water flowing to the nose. There's also the sense from your fingertips when you perform the surgery. So you need to combine all of these to make the judgment. But even then, you cannot know with 100% certainty, right? So you need to find your own method of decision through experience. You need to find it and your way to confirm if membrane perforation occurred or not according to your style. As I mentioned earlier, you need to combine at least three factors. CT reading, what you sense from surgery, and the clinical symptom of the patient, whether water flows to the nose. If these three factors are confirmed, it won't be a 100% guarantee, but you can make a pretty accurate judgment. I chat often with clinicians who just have started their own practice. They have many questions. The most frequent question is about the membrane ripping every time. Although it's just a few surgical cases so far, it always perforates. They say that it rips every time. The preventive measure, as I emphasized, is that drilling without shaking is important. So I recommend navigation surgeries such as Dionavi. If you want to perform the surgery in the analog way, you need to use both hands when drilling. To repeat, stop at the precise location and stabilize the handpiece using both hands to eliminate as much movement. If there's no shaking in the drilling, you can do this up-down motion. 
But if the jaw shakes, it goes in like this. This part will touch the membrane first, then perforation occurs. So try to keep the motion vertical as much as possible. And use both hands to prevent shaking, and it will help a lot even if you're not using navigation surgery. Right, that's the principle. So I'm not saying you must do navigation no matter what. If drilling without shaking is possible, in principle, perforation does not occur. In fact, strictly speaking, hydraulic elevation is similar to the osteotome protocol. What I mean is, if you drill right before inserting saline at the very end, you can feel the bone lift very slightly. It indicates that the sinus floor is drilled and you can perform hydraulic elevation. This process is similar to osteotome, right? So the crestal approach, which accompanies hydraulic elevation, is similar to the osteotome system. Let's summarize. Hydraulic elevation is basically a blind technique. For example, if there is 2 to 3 millimeters of remaining bone and you lift the membrane with hydraulic elevation, you can clearly see through the hole that the membrane moves up and down every time the patient breathes. However, we don't only treat cases with thin bones. This is actually rare. It's easy to check for membrane perforation in thin bone cases, but they are rare. Most of the time, the remaining bone is thicker. More common cases have remaining bone thickness of 4 to 5 millimeters. It's hard to see when you try to check for perforation, so the Cresto approach is called a blind technique. It's difficult to check for perforation with 100% certainty. There may be times when you're not sure. It's especially difficult to know when there is a lesion. If you don't physically remove the lesion, it's hard to see the membrane condition. It's very difficult to check if the membrane has ripped or not if there's a lesion on the membrane of the maxillary sinus. It does help to check if the saline comes out from the nose. If you can visually see a loose membrane moving up and down, if the mirror gets frosted, how the pressure is, if it foams in the maxillary sinus when the patient blows their nose while blocking one side. But you can't do all of these things. So I usually do a few of these things. I ask the patient to blow their nose. Next, I add some saline and ask if water is flowing to their nose. Third, I check what I sense in my fingers when I add with a syringe. I always check these three. So I think a consistent way to check is to use a syringe. The pressure you feel in your hands when you insert saline with a syringe, and if there is a small amount of blood in the front of the syringe when you take it out. I think these are pretty accurate ways to check. We all find our own ways. So in order to not rip the membrane, we first need to stop the drilling at the precise location. Even if you are very confident of your accuracy, you have to stop precisely at the desired location to prevent overdrilling. Overdrilling leads to membrane perforation right away. So precise stopping is the first prerequisite. Second is, as emphasized, drilling that does not shake. It cannot shake. If it shakes, the chance of membrane perforation is much higher. In that aspect, I think the DO Navi system is very excellent. Third, conduct the surgery like you are doing osteotome. If there's a feeling of slight bone lifting, then the membrane most likely doesn't rip. This doesn't only apply when you use the Dionavi kit, but also when you use an analog surgical kit, and when there is a bone lifting feeling during hydraulic elevation, there is low chance of membrane perforation. Lastly, during final drilling, I recommend you use low-speed RPM immediately before hydraulic elevation. With high-speed drilling, the drill will move around and raise the chances of membrane perforation. There's another advantage to using low-speed drilling with little movement. It's easy to notice the feeling of drilling that I mentioned before. When you use low speed, the drill goes in smoothly at one point. But at high speed, it's hard to sense that feeling. I'll do a final summary of the lecture. For those performing hydraulic elevation of maxillary sinus, add around 3 cc's per tooth instead of 0.8 cc's. As a routine, I add about 3 cc's per tooth. 
Bone formation improves simply by increasing the saline amount during hydraulic elevation. It's not even a special method. You just increase the amount of saline per tooth to achieve this. This suggests that the best way to prevent the membrane from relaxing is to elevate the membrane widely. If elevation is done widely, then the tension of the membrane decreases overall. I think this result is achieved because of the decrease in tension. There are a number of dentists who think that relapse of the membrane occurs no matter what in hydraulic elevation of the maxillary sinus. But if you actually try wide membrane elevation, there aren't that many occurrences of relapse. Also, I explained the ossification process earlier. Let's think about the healing process. The membrane was elevated a lot. Then blood clot will form. This will gradually become granulation tissue. Since the tension has increased overall, relapse does not occur. But temporary mucosal thickening seems to occur frequently after two to three months or five months. However, after this time passes, ossification proceeds well. You can think of it this way. So if the result improves this much by simply increasing the amount of saline per tooth, then I think this is an advantage anyone can use. If it aligns well with your philosophy, I don't think it's a bad idea to try it. I particularly think the Dionavi system is a specialized system for hydraulic elevation. As a speaker for Dionavi, I do give many lectures. But most dentists consider Dionavi as a huge advantage to anterior maxillary treatment. But I think there is a bigger advantage in hydraulic elevation. Of course, you can perform better in anterior maxillary surgeries by using Dionavi. But for maxillary sinus surgeries, it's most important to prevent membrane perforation. You can elevate the membrane a lot or move to the next step when first there isn't perforation. Since it prevents membrane perforation, I think the Dionavi system is a very good system. Thank you for listening up to now. This is my Kakao Talk ID and email. If you have any questions, you can ask at any time. I'll explain in detail if you contact me. Or if you ask a local DO representative, they will connect you so you can contact me personally. So you can ask me questions at any time. Thanks for listening. Thank you.